start recording the class. Um, all right, any questions today as uh, we move on with chapter one? Uh, I'm just gonna sit here for a minute, see if anybody has any, any old business. All right. I'm assuming no old business and <laughs> fantastic. Um, so last night, social observation was due. <clears throat> uh, thumbs up if you submitted that. Fantastic. Um, if you didn't submit that and you get to it today sometime, I imagine the GTAs will grade it, even though you might, you know, uh, lose a couple points for it being late. Uh, but if you can and you did miss it right now, you're like, what? Uh, then please go check it out. All right. Uh, see that the videos are getting watched uh, on the YouTube channel. If you want to subscribe to that so that you get, you know, sort of the first update or announcement when I, when I upload it, please do. You're welcome to. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, we've got uh, $30 raised for between my uh, classes. And I think it was uh, one class, you know, a couple donations, but that's cool. Um, CU has donated. I've got a couple classes there doing something in Boulder County, and they've donated 15 bucks. Um, so we are officially started with the food drive for spring 2021. So the goal to get 25 extra credit points is $5,000, um, which will provide 10,000 meals. So we got 30 bucks. And uh, for those people that are, what? Like, no, I'm not, I'm not like, ah, oh, we have 30. We don't, we're not far enough. It's early. We're going to, we're going to get 5,000. Will we get 9,000 like last semester? Hmm. I hope so. That would be fantastic. Uh, all right. So let me continue then with, um, I'm gonna pull up this here and let me do a screen share and I want to start to, all right. So uh, last time, um, oh, sorry, presentation mode, I guess, with this thing. I'm trying to do something a little different. Uh, it looked like the formatting, uh, like I said, I had uh, posted all the videos and done that business uh, last, at the end of last summer, before last fall. But the file, not the, not the videos themselves, but the file that was created that you could download, uh, reformatted everything in a weird way. So I'm going to, um, you know, go with this one. Uh, because it should not have writing overlapping and all that stuff. So anyway, all right. Uh, last time we talked about, sorry, um, two factors that help us gain a sociological perspective. So like I said before, good test question. Um, one of them being socially marginal or being not part of the dominant group. And the other is living through a social crisis. So uh, periods of change and crisis make everybody feel off balance whatever that might be. And then that really encourages the use of the sociological perspective. Suddenly you're experiencing something really different. People are trying to adapt. And so they're seeing things from multiple perspectives, right? So times of crisis shape and reshape the way we think. Um, who has an example of this? Like how we've somehow changed our perspective um, by going through a social crisis, like before or after or during. Anybody have an example? Nine eleven. Yep, and that's I think I think the typical right, the typical example um, or the one that we come up most often with would be that. So, how did our perspectives change? How were they changed, like before nine eleven and after nine eleven? What what was different? If you're if we're saying that that things became different, how so? And you can click in, unclick your mic, and answer that as a question, or you can type whatever. Security. Security like airport security and in stadiums and stuff like that, that all happened after 9 11 too. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say, and I used to fly a bunch, my partner and I would fly to concerts all the time. And if we were put in a line to get searched, it was only because we were young hippies and it was totally random. Uh, but, but it was, it was very easy. And, and oftentimes they would fly planes that were like half full. You could lay over three seats. You could, you know, so yeah, so many ways, um, and, and of course, some of the airport security is just for looks, and some of it is effective. So, um, 
Okay, so views on Muslim population or prejudice. Uh, does anybody want to explain that? Madison or anybody who, somebody who said that maybe? Um, so I feel like after 9-11 occurred a lot, uh, there was an increase in prejudice executed towards people of the Muslim faith or people who, um, you know, were associated with that. Yeah. Yeah. And more importantly, associated with that faith, but no association to the events of 9-11 whatsoever. Um, I had a student and a good friend. She identifies as she um, and she's from India. And, you know, this is 10 years ago, but I remember this and I'm still friends with her to this date. And she was like, yeah, I'm from India. And people are like, go home to the Middle East and calling her all sorts of names. And she's like, that's not even where I'm from. <laughs> right. So forget if you're Muslim or not, but brown folks. Right. A lot of aggressive racism towards those folks. Um, uh, so let's stick with 9-11 uh, for, for just a minute. What else was different before and after that changed our sociological perspective? What do you think? Anything else? I don't think that Americans have ever like loved immigration, but I think that we're more worried about it now. And like with the Muslim ban, the travel bans, I mean, I don't think that that ever would have happened without 9-11. It never would have been allowed to happen at least. Yeah, um, absolutely. Good. Uh, all right, so then somebody, uh, big baby boom after now, does, uh, does right now count? Yeah, abs absolutely it counts right now, right? Um, we're in the midst of something that has changed people's perspectives with just about everything that you used to do, right? How many people, just a show of hands, find themselves watching movies or commercials and you're like, wait, they're sitting too close, <laughs> right? Or you're like, like even, and it doesn't make any sense and I'm not saying it's right. And we're, you know, of course we want to suspend our beliefs so that we also enjoy things that are not like in this moment, but I still find myself reframing that through right now. And I'm like, Oh my God, look at how many people are at that concert. And I'm like, wait a second. I lived my life at concerts, you know? So all of a sudden, right. We're, we're thinking of things differently. We're seeing things differently. Um, and, and sometimes that can be positive and sometimes um, not so much. Right. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, why do I have this Jedi thing here? Uh, fired. The middle one says fired. As it turns out, those were the droids you were looking for. That's right. Got to lose your job somehow. But I think sociology is um, a great way to turn into or to, sorry, cultivate a perspective that kind of makes you a Jedi, for lack of a better word you know, or better idea. You're understanding where people are coming from, from different perspectives. You're realizing social patterns. You're seeing how that leads to direct things in people's lives, whether that's with climate or racism or gender pieces. And then you know how to manipulate those points of views because you understand those points of views, right? And not just your own. So I think, you know, to be able to cultivate the sociological imagination um, is an important part of all of this, right? And 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 in in sort of I think gaining some power in your own lives. Uh, all right, so we're going to talk about it's kind of dry, but I still like it. And we have to sort of get um, sociological theory. We gotta we've got to get rooted in that right now, so that although your social observation was fantastic, we're going to you're going to learn the tools that you need to really do something about that and make sense of it with sociological theory. So instead of just people watching, then you've got the science and the data to back it up, which is obviously really, really, really important. Um, oh, yeah, well, we'll get back to that. I've, there's a couple of newsworthy things that are interesting um, that we're gonna talk about uh, in regards to renewable energy and uh, stuff like that. We'll get to that later. So sociological theory. Logical, rigorous framework for the interpretation of social life that makes particular assumptions and asks particular questions about the social world. Like I said before at the beginning of, and we already did this each chapter, we're going to ask questions. We make assumptions, we ask questions, we collect data, and to do that, it's just real basic. Many of you um, have already had this in a physical science, right, or another science course, and that's just theory, a statement of how and why specific facts are related. Right. So it's the job of sociological theory then, you know, to explain what? Well, behavior, social behavior in the real world, the thing that you just went out and observed last night, the thing that you observe every single 
time you're with your family or you go out someplace with your friends or you're interacting or you're just watching the news or a TV show. Um, and so that's why we do sociological theory and that's why it's important. And to do so, we've got to conduct research, okay? Um, and you have to do that to be able to test and refine social theories, okay? So basic stuff here, sociological theory and a theory and of course, um, we are recording this, so uh, if I go on to another one and you're still looking at this, you can slow it down, you can pause it when you're doing the playback. All right, so sociological theory. Two basic questions in building theory, okay? What issues should we study and how should we connect the facts? And I've got some birthing things here. Um, I am really, 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 really interested in, um, in birthing and home birth uh, and things like that. We did two home births. My partner did two home births here. Uh, well, not here, I guess at our last, oh, am I muted? No, sorry. Uh, we did two home births at our last place, Julie did. Um, so to me, it's like very important that we do that piece, right? What issues should we study and how do we connect the facts? So something interesting to me is birthing, just all birthing. Um, whether that's home birth or whether that's being born at a hospital. And then we look at that and we say, well, how do we connect the facts? What are we looking at? We're we looking at infant mortality rate. Are we looking at a safer birthing place now that um, we're experiencing COVID? Is it safer to birth at home? How long throughout history have people been doing so? Why do people think that birthing in a hospital is safer? Um, even though you have access to a lot of technology, we know that infant mortality rate for this country is um, in a much different place. There are places that have a lot less money and a lot less technology that do birthing better. So um, that's one of the things that we're gonna look at. And let me look at now because I have a list of uh, responses from Top Hat. And that is, um, what issues would you like to study from a sociological perspective? So some of these are a lot, all, most of these we will talk about this semester. There's a couple funny answers um, uh, <laughs> that we'll get to here. But let me read off this list. Because when I ask, what should we study or what you're interested in studying, this is real life application. Theory, we, that's what we apply once we decide something to study. I want to make birthing safer for people. Or I want to have, I want to look at genital mutilation and find out why circumcision is still a big thing amongst like people who identify or identify their babies as the gender male, when primarily it doesn't serve a religious function anymore. So what does that look like? Like we do this or pick these topics so that we can actually get into something and make an impact. So let me look now at this. What, uh, what issues would you like to study from a sociological perspective? Poverty, five, gender inequality, five, climate change, the environment climate change. This is my favorite one so far, something related to horses. Yes, excellent. Uh, is there, can sociology be been about horses? You bet. I mean, one of the most interesting sociological observations in a, any small time and place ever in my life was going to the rodeo at the Equine Center a handful of years back. It was awesome. And I'll tell you, yeah, anyway, there's a lot of great sociology. That's, should I tell you my story from there? Right? So I take the boys and we're watching the rodeo and it's, you know, it's a lot of good old boys and girls and gals and, and uh, not, not necessarily a crowd that I'm used to, but it was a ton of fun, right? And so like a lot of people with cowboy boots and belt buckles and I'm making like observations about all sorts of behaviors and the, the announcer says, you know what NASCAR stands for? And I'm like, oh, this guy's going for a NASCAR joke. Interesting. And he's like, non-athletic sports centered around rednecks. And I was like, right, I'm sitting in the middle of that place. And I let out a huge laugh. I'm like, ah, oh, that's great. And I look around and like, there's not that many people around me laughing. There are some though, right? So the question that I had to ask is, is there competition between NASCAR and like rodeo stuff? I would have thought that those were the exact same overlapping like crowds. Turns out they're not. The people in the rodeo crowd that deal with animals are like, we have specific knowledge. I'm not driving around in a circle. I'm riding the back of a multi-thousand pound like creature that could crush my skull, right? So it was really interesting to me to observe in that, like any time that you are not, right, part of that dominant group or in that subculture or whatever it is. So yes, we can do sociology centered around horses as well. Um, okay, uh, oppression of gamers. Hmm. Interesting. I'm not so sure I, I know about that, but uh, 
but I did pay uh, an interesting price for a black market PS5 down in Denver uh, for my son over the break. I won't tell you about that. It's a little sketchy, but I'm here to tell the tale. Anyway, um, and boy, that PS5 is fun. Let me tell you about it. I'm not even a gamer. But that's, those, that's pretty cool. Okay. Symbolic interactions to pros. Chan, trans citizen involvement in the military. Yes. Uh, judging a book by its cover. Um, what issues would you like to study? Men versus women in relationship-esque dynamic. Uh, uh, homelessness and unequal educational opportunities, um, relationship between socioeconomic household incomes and how it relates to the population of people going to college, unemployment, mental health disorders, drug abuse, something related to off-roading, hmm. uh, how lockdowns have impacted mental health and drug abuse, yes, um, and suicide rates, so mental health for sure, uh, race conflict, um, a distribution of wealth and why it is uh, this way. Poverty in America. How many people or how or why people choose partners? Ooh, yeah. I find that very, very, very interesting as well. Um, racism, feminism, uh, COVID-19's impact on socialized race conflicts, crime, wealth inequality, gender as a social construct, construct, romantic relationships, workplace relationships, and racial conflict would be an interest to say yes. Um, drugs. Uh, climate change, gender issues, education, food insecurity, racism, violence against women, racism and discrimination, food insecurity, animal rights, Black Lives Matter, the link between race and poverty, gender inequalities, mental, okay, wow, okay, I'm just going to say right now, many of these things we will study. I'm not sure about off-roading, maybe there's a way we can figure that out. Um, what did you pick, but more importantly, why? Like. Uh, I think that everybody that chose something that came to your mind that's important for you to study has a reason. And again, in sociology, that's the most important thing. Let's pick a few of these. Not too many, but a few of them. Uh, why did you choose what you chose? I guess, what did you choose and then why? Do you know if the Louis thing is true? Is that why women birth laying down? That always seemed weird to me. Um, I would have to look that up, but I would say this. Uh, the science is in. Um, it's easier to birth squatting using gravity uh, than, than on your back, which defies all notions of that. And, and do I think it has to do with the gender construct of dominant gender? Absolutely, I do. Um, anyway, what did you choose and why? Anybody? Or I'll keep going, but I'll wait a second. I chose animal rights. Okay, why? Um, so probably like what would you study specifically or what interests you or what question is like, that doesn't make sense to me. So now I want to do something with it. You know, that's kind of that sociology piece is that part of whatever the things that make you go. Mm. That's fair. Probably like the people that oppose me on like what rights animals should have. So like, I don't know, some people that are in like the animal science majors or like people who do food production, maybe to understand why they do things why they do it or like sometimes like you know two different people will see a situation differently so like i'll see them treating an animal a certain way and they're like that's just how we do it and i'm like you're being super rough and that's abusive so i want to like understand why they think that so i don't just oppose them but i understand awesome yeah and if you understand you will have the tools necessary to make the right persuasive argument to maybe change some minds right? To maybe get some laws enacted. I mean, think about it. Raise your hand if you've heard of Temple Grandin. That individual is, if you haven't heard of that individual, that individual is a gem, is a hero, and for animal rights, I mean, even though she's working with animal processing and cow processing, I, I, there's a student of mine from one of these classes that I had like a really, really great Zoom meeting with last week about all of that. Anyway, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. How are we going to know, if we don't know what somebody else thinks, how are you going to have a chance to change your mind? You know, and, and, and you can't, because not all of us are Jedis. I am, right? I can just wave my hand and be like, these are the droids are looking for, yeah. from a certain point of view, <laughs> right? But, but not everybody can do that, you know? Sorry, that's just my least favorite thing that Obi-Wan says. He's like, yeah, you know, I told you he was your dad, sort of, from a certain point of view. Oh, my gosh. That should have been fisticuffs right there. Wait, he, was he a ghost at that point? Okay, can you slap a force ghost? I don't know. We'll get past that. All right. Uh, excited for her lecture. Chose homelessness because I've done a lot of community service work. Um, chose equal education opportunities because I have friends who are not able to go to college because of financial situation. Good. 
distribution of wealth. Because I always thought it was crazy how much the world's wealth is owned by the 1%. How much is owned by the 1%? An increasing and increasing and increasing and increasing amount. Um, and we will look at that on our chapter in social stratification. Absolutely. Um, one of the most influential animal rights ethicists teaching here on campus, Professor Bernard Rowland. Okay. There's, you know, I love it when my students provide like other insight for other students or links or things that might be fantastic. So good. Um, okay. One more. Who chose, what did you choose to study and why? I chose cults because it's very interesting. They tend to, from what my understanding, they always tend to follow similar steps to get people inducted. And I think it's very interesting because most of the time the people who are in the cult don't even recognize it and they can get them to do extreme things. And we have like history of some very famous cults here in America. So I just thought it was interesting. Absolutely. I mean, if patriotism is your calling card and you can get people to murder police officers with American flags while committing an act of insurrection, that's, that's cult. Um, and what short memory we have. Wow. Uh, I did just read today that two police officers since then have committed suicide that were part of that. Um, so this has some pretty far reaching impacts. I'm only hoping that, um, you know, people can be held accountable. That's, that's what we really need to do. But yeah, um, radicalization is something that we're hearing now right? You usually hear it, I think, in an American context with Islamic radicalization. Um, but that could be QAnon, that could be really anything, could be religious radicalization, another uh, way that we sort of think of that in terms of things like that, but good. Um, and of course, look at those things in terms of how, if, if these are really good people and average people like everybody else, how can they get sucked into this? What can we do about that? And actually, I am I currently just this morning was watching a podcast about sociologists that are doing just that, uh, finding out ways and collecting data to get people weaned from like political radicaliz radicalization or religious radicalization. All right, good. All these things, um, interesting and I think worthy uh, to study. And I know this morning, um, or I know that I was just saying um, uh, genital mutilation, which I know probably surprised a few people. Um, that's another word for it is circumcision. Um, but we'll talk about that. Uh, I know that I mentioned birthing, but there's a lot of, lot of issues with birthing and toxic masculinity, things like that, that are related to circumcision and trauma um, that I think we could study. And I'll talk about this semester too. So. Um, don't usually like to drop that out of no place, but <laughs> it has its uh, you know, worth for us this semester to learn about that. All right, so uh, Molly Ringwald, Breakfast Club. If you haven't seen the movie, The Breakfast Club, it's one of my favorites of all time. Um, she's also one of the most famous gingers I know of. Uh, all right, so we're gonna be looking at things this semester from a big perspective, a macro perspective, and from a micro perspective. Again, if we are talking about the sciences or you've ever had a science class, you're probably like, wow, there's some overlap here. Absolutely. We're not just people watching, like I said. Um, we are doing sociology. We're doing this as a social science. So a lot of it initially here too is going to be that sort of repeat of the science part. So you should recognize things like this macro theories concerned with large scale patterns and in institutions. And yes, we are looking at patterns, social patterns. When something happens, we identify it, it happens again. And we look at that, then we look at its sociological momentum or inertia. What does that mean? How can we stop that? Because if we're going to say we want to stop racism or white supremacy, another scientific term that I just mentioned that's very real in social science is inertia. So to do that, after hundreds of years of inertia of white supremacy, you're going to have to put like equal or greater energy into that. All right. So micro level paradigms, similarly, but on an up close and personal level. So theories concerned with social relations, interactions, um, and in specific and individual situations, right? So again, the big picture could be divorce rates and marriage rates and things like that. The micro level thing could be relationships, you know, um, on a, just a individual relationship or pressures put on people in certain ways and what's that look like. And so all semester long, big picture and small picture. Now, I'm not sure how many of you uh, have done the better one, better two. How many people have had glasses before and they strap this thing up in front of you and they're like, better one, better two, better one, better two, better one, better two, better five, 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 five. and then you're finally at the end, you're like, I I think you just showed me the same thing like five times, um, which they, they do. I'm not sure five times, but certainly by the end, you're kind of placebo land. So this is what I'm talking about though, right? It's 
a roadmap or a framework, uh, a better one, better two, better three, better four, multiple ways to look at society. And that way that we look at that, that sociological theoretical approach, that's that image that guides our thinking and our research, right? Now, there are many theoretical approaches, race conflict and gender conflict, and we're gonna talk about those. I did mention those um, on some of the questions that I had for class today. So we are primarily though this semester going to be looking at these three, structural, functional, social conflict, and symbolic interaction or interactionist. Now, these are just different maps or frameworks for seeing society. This is the structure for looking at behavior. So when we see behavior, I don't know, firefighters that have boots and they're collecting money for like donations for whatever, whatever that might be, right? Then we look at it and we say, oh, from this perspective, it looks like this. From this perspective, I can see it this way. And structural, functional, and social conflict, those are both macro, and I'll get to that, but big perspectives. And then we look at symbolic and actionist, and that's up close and personal. You, your relationship, your group of friends, um, smaller things than like the CSU student body. All right. Take a drink here. Here's some preonite. Not sure how many of you people are into gems and mineral. The green is preonite and it's in epido. Preonite actually forms round in nature and then epido is straight. Uh, interesting stone. Anybody here ever been to the gem and mineral show down in Denver? It's pretty fantastic if you're into that kind of thing. All right. Gender conflict and race conflict. So gender conflict focuses on inequality and conflict between men and women. Um, I would say expanding this from our textbooks definition into um, as many dimensions of gender as we can identify. Um, and the work of Jane Addams, and of course, during the work of Jane Addams, um, you know, uh, gender is pretty binary, um, which it is not anymore as much anyway. And then race conflict focuses uh, on inequality and conflict between uh, people of different racial ethnic categories, um, yeah, what can you do with that degree? Sociology, I don't know, deconstruct your social reality. I think it's a pretty powerful thing. Um, we will look at this. We'll be addressing gender issues in almost every single chapter. We'll be addressing race issues and inequality issues in every single chapter, issues of dominant culture and non-dominant culture. So we are going to incorporate these um, into the rest of the paradigms or theoretical perspectives that we're looking at this semester. All right. All right, keep this up here for a minute. So um, before I jump into any one of them, and I think I'll jump into functionalist first, but here's a way, I've got some really long definitions coming up, but again, some of what I think is important is for me to take things that are intense and break them down for people. Um, so this is the simplified version of these. Functionalist society is viewed as stable and orderly system. That's like a macro perspective. So things are working. How do we know this? I don't know. I look over here on class uh, and it says we got 93 people here on class. This is during the time when we're here. Uh, woke up this morning and for the first time in a long time or second time in a long time, I took the boys to school. Uh, I didn't see any airplanes dropping out of the sky or zombies on people's backs. Things are working, right? And this is a macro perspective. Now, in uh, conflict to that or in juxtaposition to that, um, <clears throat> we can look at uh, the conflict perspective, which is going to tell us that groups in society are engaged in a continuous power struggle for control of scarce resources. Um, so functionalist, things are working. Conflict, things are not working. You know, things, are, things are not only not working for a conflict perspective, they're purposefully not working. They're written into the very fabric of our institutions, okay? So those are two different perspectives. And that is also a macro perspective. And then lastly, symbolic interactions. So specific interaction amongst people, you know, Storm and Zion and their group of friends while they're gaming uh, or at school, um, people dating uh, in a certain, you know, area or just a couple. We could look at something like that, but it's very micro. It's very small, up close in person. Okay. Let me look at this chat, see if somebody has a question here. A really good fiction series that has conflict theoretical approach behind it's called Cruel. Oh, I, I did hear about that. 
Um, all right, so let's start off. Let's go back here. And um, a lot of times I color code things, you know, like last time I had macro, macro, and blue. That, I just do that and I put pictures up and I try and make these a little more interesting simply because many of you are visual learners, right? Um, so structural functional approach. I told you this was gonna be a bit wordy. You can have this here, you can write it down, but really a framework for building theory that sees society as a complex system whose parts work together to promote solidarity and stability. But I said that last one, society is viewed as a stable and orderly system, right? So what makes society tick? It's working. Here is at least one test question off the bat, which is um, who coined the term sociology, August Comte, when 1838? Jason, will you be heavy on the dates and the names? Not necessarily, um, but these are really important folks. Durkheim is a really important sociological individual. Merton, really important. Spencer, and these are some of the people that supported this view, you know? Society's pretty stable and it's working. Um, and of course, we'll look at the next one, which we know says, you know, something quite a bit different than that. So, but what that points to is structure. Okay. So, any relatively stable pattern of social behavior, another great test question. But if we're going to know what structural functionalist theory is, we've got to know that at least. What are you talking about, Jason, when you talk about structure? Well, any relatively stable pattern of social behavior. Okay. So, let me see here. Does anybody have uh, any examples of social structure? Any relatively stable pattern of socialization? Um, I'm going to pick somebody who I can see right now. Um, let me see. Oops, sorry about that. Let me go back. Let me stop sharing for a minute. And Ian, uh, there you go. How's it going, man? Uh, uh, I'm going to wave at you. How's it going? Up. There we go. All right. Boom. Social structure right there. Okay. It could be something like a gesture, right? So I wave at you. And instead of, if I waved it at Ian and Ian went like this, <laughs> like ducked or something like that, we might have a problem. We might have a miscommunication. We might not understand the social structure, but we do, right? We, we know that a handshake is a form of a greeting and that's a social structure, right? So let's Go back to screen share here once and look at some examples of this. Professor Downing. Yes. I have a question about that. Yep. Um, so you know how sometimes like if you make a really quick motion towards someone like going for a handshake or like it's still a friendly motion, but like they kind of like duck and kind of like that. How would structural functional theory view that? It, it wouldn't. That's just more of a reflex, <laughs> right? I mean, we could talk about like violence in society and stuff like that. But but if I go like this, hey, to shake your hand, and then you're like, you don't, or, or, or something like that, that could be a cultural piece. Then we can talk about that, right? I mean, if you don't know stuff about certain religions and points of views, and you go to touch somebody, but that's not how they do things, then that structure, that, that structure is different in that society. And then you would look at what that structure is for that culture. Right. I mean, if we go around the earth giving thumbs up or a peace sign, some places are going to get it and some places are going to get aggressive. <laughs> right. Because if we know anything, this this means this in lots of places in the world. Right. So each society, each culture has different structure and different functions. OK, so before structure, stable pattern. OK. And then social function, the consequences of that pattern. Um, for society as a whole. So what are the social patterns? And then a lot of these social patterns really just function to tie people together, to keep society going, at least in its present form. Somebody said to me the other day, I've been reading online that wealth is going to change hands dramatically this year. And I'm like, <laughs> I was like, I mean, and this person, and I, you know, I've got my own hippie things. This person, I don't mean that in a bad way, but this person was very cosmic, which I think is very wonderful. But I'm also like, yeah, you know, the last thousand years or 500 years of human nature would tell me likely not, likely not that people have wealth. And we know just in the last year of COVID, billionaires have gotten richer and richer and richer, that social stratification. So anyway, um, a lot of times society functions 
to keep going in its present form. I mean, it'd be nice if we had a wealth distribution that was different. Now getting to that is a much different story, right? I mean, we're not just gonna go up to all those people and be like, Elon, my man, I need a few bill. Gotta distribute that to my friends. You cool with that? And he'd be like, I'm sorry, arrest this individual. I don't know. I wouldn't even be close enough to say that to him, but the point is likely not gonna happen. So structure is a handshake. The function is a greeting, all right? So if the structure is college, what's the function? You're all paying a whole bunch of money for some reason. Lay it on the line. Tell me about it. What's the function of college? I feel like maybe the function of college might be more like social uh, confirmation. It's like it's expected of you. And so that's why we're here. I like that. Uh, yes. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. How about marriage broker? I mean, I went to a small school and I did not, I did not marry somebody from Luther College where I went to. But it's a thing to like get married to somebody that went to Luther and then take pictures of your baby in like the little Luther onesie and then send it into the Luther magazine. I mean, for me, that's like, ah. but that's kind of like expected. People are going to hook up. Things happen. Right. And then and so maybe but but if you look in the CSU handbook, you'd be like marriage broker, marriage broker. There it is on page 32. Going to hook up. No. Right. That's that's that. And so we're going to get to the difference in functions between manifest and latent manifest what we say we're all about function wise and and latent the secretive kind of thing or the, or the, the, the interesting sociological reason behind it that might not be expressed. So college. And I would think you started with the less obvious one. I like that one. Um, okay, so I'm going to read over here to get a degree that prepare to get a degree that prepares you for the future profession and I'm not making fun of you can I'm just reading I think that is the standard function of college to get a degree that prepares you for a future profession. Good. Um, what else. Yes. Ian. Oh, sorry, Skylar, go ahead. I think it helps just like diversify how you view the world culturally and exposes you to different ideas. Um, obviously you're learning different terminology and such to like express yourself, but it's also you're just absorbing so many different views and things like that. Yeah, I think a function of college is to be around more diverse people. Is CSU more diverse than the community that it is set in? Yes, yeah. By a lot, absolutely, all the way, all day long. Um, that's good, good, good. I think that's an expectation. And I think we even say that. So instead of like hooking up or relationship, I think being exposed to diversity is even written down as an expectation in many places. Good, Ian, sorry, uh, hold up. Yeah, no problem. Um, I think to a certain extent, I don't think it's one of the main reasons, but um, it can kind of be like class signaling if that makes sense. Um, uh, explain. Yeah, so having it as more of a, uh, having a college degree is more of a status thing than a practical application. And of course there's like the scandals with USC, people just paying large amounts of money so they can get into highly accredited colleges um, right. just to kind of have that title, I guess. Right, so yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there is something positional about it in that I just read yesterday that 90% of people complete high school or complete their high school programs, only 34% of people complete a four-year degree. I see the looks on your faces. I'm going to say this right now. I know so many of my friends, and they are all fantastic individuals who did not complete a four-year degree. I, so many. And though I think that they are all tremendous people, I think starting something and finishing it in and of itself is worth a very, very, it's, it's, I don't even know what it's worth. It's worth a tremendous amount beyond just the degree, being able to complete that thing. I mean, if considering 90 versus 34%, that's a pretty big drop off. Then I think it's 13% for people uh, that have master's degrees and 1% for beyond that. So absolutely good is a positional way. So maybe that's not stated, but certainly some people go to like community colleges for two years and then get a degree somewhere else because the only real degree that the name that matters on your final four-year degree is not, not the community college, right? Because uh, if you're going to use your degree, it's probably not as impressive to be like, and I teach there and I love front range, but it's not as impressive pro probably to be like, that's right, sociology major, 
Front Range Community College. Or somebody's like, that's right, sociology major, Harvard. <laughs> I mean, right? Now that doesn't mean that the person at Front Range that had to put themselves through school and learn a whole lot and study and work five jobs didn't learn more. You never know. Okay, uh, good. Marriage. Social structure is marriage. What's the function? Now these are getting more difficult, aren't they? Yeah, let's do it. What do you think? <laughs> Kate, I didn't mean your answer was robot-y. I meant that it was perfect. It was absolutely what everybody here is paying like over $100,000 to do in reality. And we might as well add, and somebody did that, more money. Strike the word potentially. If you're going to college to make less money and pay $100,000 to do it, I suggest you keep the 100 Gs. All right? So we have an expectation of that. Yes, Lori. Um, so I guess I would, the way I, uh, <laughs> so I would say that marriage is like, um, it's the socially acceptable way of showing your commitment to another human being. Okay, so. In terms of companionship, I guess. Sure, all right. So somebody wrote companionship. So companionship, but also showing companionship right? I mean, it's an out, it's an outward thing oftentimes, okay? Uh, what else is the function of marriage? Yes, Carmen? I feel like there's this belief a lot of times, at least here in America, like the, I don't know if it's the American dream, but like you're supposed to like grow up, find somebody, get married, and have kids. So I think that's why a lot of people have problems. Like if you're not married and you have kids, like my parents aren't together, and a lot of parents are like, well, you're not married. And I think it's like, they believe that you have to be married on paper for your child to have a good upbringing when that's not true at all, I don't think. No, no. And going back to more gender constructs, I mean, do we really need men? Like, do people really need, like, like there's plenty, like, to procreate? Like, there's plenty of places where you can go and do that without, without anybody who identifies with that gender. So absolutely good. Um, legal binding family. Sure. Taxes. I saw taxes there. Write-offs maybe for kids. Tax purposes. Um, two incomes. It can be cheaper. Marriage is more about finding purpose or meaning in life. We're wired to find love. Yeah, but we can obviously find love without signing a document, right? Uh, so, so once you enter into that agreement, that's now a binding law abiding type of thing. That's, that's different um, than just expressing your love for each other once you enter into that because it's a structure of society, right? So, okay, I think marriage allows you to have a life partner growth. You can allow me, yes. Yes, you need men in society. That's right, James. Um, and I feel like my Mormon friends got married for the function of, hey, if, if, if yes, the function of marriage is also not just to procreate, but to have sex. And then believe that or not, um, it is true. And people seem to like it. That's, that's why abstinence hasn't been a very successful approach for all of time. Okay, um, good. Okay, so let's move on. But now you get an idea of the structure of something, handshake, college, marriage, prison, and then the function that it serves, right? And, and that's not always, I mean, it's not always the function that it's supposed to serve necessarily, okay? And this is, what I, this is why I really like this right here. This is when we're getting into good sociology. Um, so arranged marriages, sorry, I'll last leave with that. Yeah, the function of an arranged marriage. I mean, uh, that marriage used to be like a dowry. You know what I'm saying? Like you have somebody at your home and they're female and they do a lot of stuff for the house. And if they're going to be missing, then you need to pay for them. Absolutely. There's a lot. And we were just talking about some of the cultural pieces of marriage in this society. When, of course, I mean, we open that up across the board globally and, and we'll look at a lot of different functions than what we mentioned. So manifest and latent. Know this for the exam. It'll be there. Okay. Absolutely. Recognized and intended consequences of a social pattern. I go to college to get a degree, to get a job, to make some money, to better my society. A, B, C, D, E, one, two, three, four, five. Intended, open, stated. There it is. Latent functions, though, this is where it gets interesting with sociology as I twist my mustache in an evil way, but also remind you that I've never applied any kind of mustache wax because I just couldn't live with myself if I did that or wore pointy shoes. 
Anyway, um, latent functions, the unwrapped pointy shoes, Jason. Uh, no, that was just a subtle dig on other adjunct professors on this campus that have nicer shoes than me. I'm just jealous. Okay, uh, unrecognized and unintended consequences of any social pattern. Unintended functions may reflect the hidden purpose of an institution. Oh, oh yeah, this is the sociology I'm into. Has anybody here ever rented before? Raise your hand if you have rented, paid a, paid a deposit. Now, tell me what the manifest function of a damage deposit is and tell me what the latent function of a de damage deposit is. They can be very different. Um, so the manifest function is just so like if you break anything, it just comes out of that deposit. Um, but I honestly think that the latent function is just so they can rape you for more money. <laughs> Da -da 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 -da. Oh, good, 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 good. Sorry, I won't lean in that close next time about that. Sorry, I don't even want to see my face that big myself, uh, ever. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Like, this is just in case, just in case, you know, you ruin the rug or put a big hole in the wall. There are for renter's rights. I used to do renter's rights with Julie in Minneapolis. We'd go in, they gave us a fake identity. And then we go in there and we tell them fake how much money we make and we interact with them and we see if they would offer us to rent. Anyway, renters' rights are most oftentimes on the side of the people who own the property. So you have to have that. But we know that there is normal wear and tear, right? You can put poles in the walls for pictures. You can paint it or maybe there's a little wear and tear to the carpet. That, they should absorb all of that. So the latent function would be, <clears throat> we're going to take your money anyway. And as a matter of fact, we're taking it while you live in here for two months or two years. And in that time, we're also investing it and making money from it. And for many of those individuals don't have at all an intention of giving it back to you, right? So again, there's those open intended consequences. And then there's the ones that are like, you know, kind of behind the scenes. What's the manifest function and latent function of the Pledge of the Legions. And I'll tell you what, I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm back in the 70s. I uh, just saw some great a photo album that I got from my house uh, a few months ago with some pictures of me and the, looking very patriotic in first grade. And boy, we would rip through that Pledge of the Legions. I think, I think my friends and I had that down to about six seconds. Pledge of the Legions, no, no. Anyway, what is the manifest and latent function of the Pledge of the Legions? Somebody who hasn't uh, chimed in yet, please. We've got 88 people here. I can wait. Anybody? What's the open intended consequence of saying the Pledge of Allegiance every single day of my school life? <laughs> you haven't, but I did. What do you think? I can open it up to the people who normally talk, but after two class se sessions, I can already tell you who those people are and you know too. So come on, somebody come forward. Show patriotism and unify people. Yes, manifest function is patriotism, right? Um, you are pledging an allegiance to a flag, to a country. You put, you know, I don't know, was this three? Was that, that's Boy Scouts, maybe. I can't remember. Pledge of allegiance is the heart. Is that right, somebody? Yes, verify this with a shake of a head. Okay, I'm guessing, yes, all right. What's the latent function? Anybody now can answer. What's the latent function of the Pledge of Allegiance? Didn't the Pledge of Allegiance start during either World War I, II, or the Cold War? I don't know exactly which one, yeah. but it was to remind like the kids which country they are a part of because there was an influx of like, I think German, immigrants it was like just to like remind them like you are an american remember your place right um yes sure but i think that falls somewhat under patriotism um latent could be some conscious manipulation i think that's again pretty stated out there to force nationalism down our throats how about this part under god okay wasn't originally written in it added to it years later for what purpose to reinforce the dominant religion, right? That doesn't mean that that's necessarily like some, you know, huge evil thing that somebody did, but 
those words were added to reinforce dominant religion. We, know, we know what the dominant religion is, dominant gender, dominant race. Um, so that was added maybe as a way to sort of reinforce that. And I would say a little bit more hmm, subtly than the patriotism thing, which I think quite clearly, you know, the, the Pledge of Allegiance is about that, you know, exactly. Okay, are we gonna talk about religion this semester? Uh, we might, we might, yeah. I'm not sure, it depends on how, how many chapters we get through. Um, all right, uh, peace guys on my way to Norway. If you're on your way to Norway, you're in trouble because I've got a buddy from Luther College that I talked to yesterday and they have closed their borders. So, sorry, if you had plans to go to Norway, I doubt you're going to be going there anytime soon. I could be wrong though. All right, uh, so latent function be calling out those people not from the United States, right? To reinforce dominant culture, dominant country, dominant religion, right? Good, good. Oh, that's your backup, right? Good, good, okay. Let me get back to here and we'll screen share. Um, so structural functional approach, main characteristic is to see society as his vision uh, uh, of society, excuse me, as stable and orderly. So be critical with this. I'm not asking you to stand up on your desk and rip your pages out and say, oh, captain, my captain, like Dead Poets Society, although that is a fantastic movie. Um, but but uh, somebody take some issue with this. What do you think? Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so from my understanding, structural functional approach basically says like, if something exists, it exists for a reason. And I'd like to point out that I don't think COVID generally has a reason other than to frighten the hell out of all of us. Um, <laughs> so yeah. All right. Um, yeah, potentially. Um, it sees society as stable and orderly. What's another, how, how else can we be critical of uh, structural functional approach? Um, I was just wanted to go off of what Lindsay just said um, with COVID. Excellent. I actually think that like when it first happened, I don't know if you remember like when we all first went into lockdown, I feel like the environment was like, it was a big break for the environment. So like that might be a reason that we, that diseases come up and stuff just because it's like mother nature fighting back or something. Yeah, and I wish on a big scale that that it would have made the impact for good in many ways, but turn off driving for a year, still have a lot of challenges, right? But yeah, absolutely. Maybe at least you can draw that. How about it? one more? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, yep. Mm -hmm. Me? Yep. Oh, okay. Um, I would say if I had like a problem with it is that you can look at something as if it works, that doesn't mean that it does. So yeah, our society has like many good points, but like things with like gender conflict, I mean, those aren't working the best. So you can't say that everything's like a-okay. Yeah, there's a lot of people and a lot of things that are not working, right? <laughs> that simply, it's not stable, it's not orderly, it's not fair, and it doesn't need to keep going, right? Yeah, and so that's our job, sort of identify that. And then in regards to that, that's why we see um, the next one, uh, the social conflict approach, okay? So this is really looking at inequality, okay? Whereas structural functional, like things are working, that's good, we know this, we've got a plan for this, society's organized in this way. Um, but this is a framework for winning theory that sees uh, society as an arena of inequality, it generates conflict and change, understood in terms of tension between competing groups. And when people think of conflict, I think they think like out in the streets and throwing tear gas and no, 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 no. Inequality. If there's one word down here at the end of the slide that I want you to know, and I say, what is the main word on a test that you have to associate with structural functionalists or social conflict? There they are right there. One, solidarity and stability, and the other, inequality. Because it's going to look at how all these factors are linked to inequality, class, race, ethnicity, gender, age, orientation, uh, sexual orientation, relationship orientation, right? Um, then we'll approach that in different ways this semester. Social conflict approach is used to look at ongoing conflicts between dominant and disadvantaged categories of people, okay? So, I mean, we know inequality exists and, and we know that it exists, we know very specifically how it exists, right? How much, do people who identify with the gender female make on the dollar on average as compared to their male counterparts? 
It's like 70 cents to the dollar or something. Around there, yeah, between 70 and 80 cents. I mean, that's institutionalized, it's measurable. And then we have to ask ourselves, does it cause conflict? And then we have to ask ourselves, is it something that needs to remain in its present form, right? And is that fair, is that equal, is that how we do things? Okay, um, so all semester long, sometimes people call this like uh, activist sociology and we'll talk about that later, um, but basically, labeling understanding inequalities and again we're not guessing at these um we're looking at these as statistically measurable or historical contexts okay um you know the civil war was not about states rights it was about the ability to continue to own slaves and get free labor and make a whole bunch of money on the backs of people who you treated less than human let's let's not revise it and say it was states rights it was not okay so um we could be critical with this really in the same way, um, meaning uh, be critical of approach. What do you think or disagree in regards to this paradigm? I'm just gonna answer this and say, uh, not everything's unequal. And in fact, there are many things in 2020 that are far better than they were only 20 years ago or 50 years ago and way better than hundred years ago. How we measure these things, whether we still have a long way to go, you name it, but not everything um not everything is um is is unequal to a large degree and of course many 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 things are which is why we look at inequality as one of our central paradigms all right so let me bring up here a couple of i like to make uh charts you know or maybe like lists when i'm looking at this as a way to study for the test and more importantly a way to remember functionalist in conflict. So functionalist society is composed of interrelated parts. It focuses on the group of a whole. Conflict society is characterized by social inequality and it focuses on the competition amongst those parts, right? And of course, I did mention that as well, but it's good for me, I guess, to re-mention it. And that's competition for scarce resources, right? I mean, jobs uh, are not infinite. The economy is not infinitely growing. Uh, food, not everybody has enough of that. You you name it, right? So there is that competition um, that that looks at as well in regards to inequality. Um, and yeah, I saw this here in the discussion, different races of women earn different amounts to add on that. Absolutely. Depending on your gender and your race, you may live up to 10 years or more uh, shorter lifespan. So I would say it is not like life or death. It is exactly the differences between these categories that we're going to be looking at this semester, um, life or death in many scenarios. All right. And from a functionalist perspective, individuals responsible for their achievements as well as their failures, meaning, and I hate this term or I dislike this term, but you hear this term, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, right? The reality is some people don't have bootstraps, but from a functionalist perspective, they're going to say, yep, the race started all at the same time. You all have equal access to this and you're responsible. If you're not doing well, that is not our fault for programming in 300 years of systemic racism and gender bias. Oh, I, <laughs> no, culture, not, they're, they're not going to say that. Dominant culture isn't going to say that. It's going to say you're responsible for yourself, right? You know all sorts of examples of people that started off with nothing, that were disadvantaged, not in dominant culture, and they've become something amazing. That's proof. While conflict is going to say, and, 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 and I need you to know that this is not, conflict isn't people aren't responsible for themselves. They just do whatever. Conflict is going to say the race didn't start at the right time. Some people have more disadvantages than others. Those disadvantages are statistically measurable and make a huge impact on people's lives. So they are responsible for their achievements or failures, but not in a system necessarily that has so many biases that construct those biases into that system. Macro and micro, uh, I've already talked about. And let's, let's do one more here. And I'm going to just fit this in quickly. Um, and that's the last paradigm. I wanted to get through that today, at least. The symbolic interactionist approach is a framework for building theory, same, same beginning, but that looks at the everyday interactions of individuals. What's going on in your group of friends? How is one group of friends considered goths and the other are gamers and the others are whatever, right? Um, what's that look like? Interpersonal communication, right? how people in relationships function, 
Um, when people at a job ask somebody to cover their shift, what are the expectations? Uh, so anyway, up close and in person. All right, um, and it focuses on how people create their realities. I mean, think about this. We have to look at this as sociologists because when we're sitting in a classroom with like two or 300 other people, everybody you're sitting next to creates their reality in the moment differently. So it is amazing to me as a sociologist that things can function this well to begin with. When every single person that I'm looking at, all you amazing, wonderful, awesome uh, human beings in front of me all believe different things, were born, have different social experiences, uh, and are completely different from the person sitting next to you, and not just in fingerprint, but in who you are, right? So symbolic interactionist is going to look up close and personal at that. All right. Um, I'm going to stop for today with the lecture. Uh, usually I'll go at least an hour. Um, before everybody signs off and I tell you to be good people and do good things, any questions uh, about anything that's coming up, anything I can help clarify uh, for you, anything. Have I shown a Star Wars toy today yet? No, but I'll show this. I don't know why this is here. He-Man. Missing a leg and he's mostly naked. I don't know how this happened. I think my son, he, uh, he collects vintage toys just like I do, but he also learns how to put them back together and then he sells them. So he's got a store on eBay so he can fix like a broken transformer that's 30 years old and then sell it for much more if he gets parts. I don't know. Anyway, I love it. So there's a, there's a little He-Man for you back from 1980 something. I have the power. Any questions? Any questions? Are we meeting Friday? No, we won't be meeting Friday. It's not, it's not my intention to. If I'm not getting far enough in a certain week with these lectures or we get into discussion about a film, I may add that on. But for now, Monday, Wednesday of this week, not Friday. Friday this week. I will encourage you to do something amazing in your lives. And uh, I'll leave it there. Be good people and do good things. I'm excited already this semester. Check out the YouTube channel, subscribe. Um, I will post this there afterwards. And then when I get around to it, after uploading it, I will post it in modules, maybe under live class lectures. So that I think I, I titled that differently so that there's a way to distinguish between the ones that I did before and the ones now. All right, take care, everybody. Peace, be well. Reach out Thank if you need you. anything. That's why Thank I'm here. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. You too.